This episode is in partnership with Authority Magazine. Authority Magazine, a medium publication, is devoted to sharing in-depth and interesting interviews featuring people who are authorities in business, pop culture, wellness, social impact, and tech. Staying healthy isn't just a matter of eating the right foods and getting enough exercise, although, of course, these are a step in the right direction. Internal and mental strength in today's challenging world also plays a major role. Today's guest is Barry Keown, but a life coach who often uses hypnotism in order to achieve inner strength. Uh, Barry Keown, but welcome to Believe in People. Thank you. Happy to be here. Listen, um, I've known you many years. Why does one choose to take a life path that leads to coaching other people? What uh, What is it uh, that drove you to do this? It was, I'll say it was an evolution rather than, a, than, than being driven. But I will say that what I've, I was always felt moved to do this kind of work um, all my life. And it was only ever in the past, maybe six, seven years that I did um, uh, a personality assessment that confirmed why I like to do this stuff or why I'm driven to do this. And one of that those things is that how my brain is wired is to um, see people reach their full potential. And when they don't, it drives me crazy. So that's um, hmm. that's why I do it. That's interesting. I was going to say, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? No, I was going to ask you what came first because you're an actor. So mm -hmm. I was acting before kind of the personal growth coach and then – when did you introduce, because I understand that you do hypnotism. When did that come into play? Yes. Okay. So, all righty. So <laughs> what came first? The acting, the acting, I will call that um, uh, moonlighting. And I'll say that it's, um, um, I am in ACTRA, the, the Canadian Actors Union, and I've been in, in that union for almost 30 years. Most of the work I've done, though, in acting is, was, was, um, uh, voiceovers and and character voices. I've also done some on screen work, but some uh, the reason I don't do it very often is because I'm not very good at it. And that's uh, that's something you have to admit to yourself that I'm uh, as my mother would have said, you're a bad actor, and she was quite right. But uh, the the reality is that um, whenever when in my corporate life, which I did for a number a number of years, almost thirty years, um, I found my greatest sense of accomplishment and my greatest joy was when I had people reporting to me where I could help them develop and help, help them grow into their roles or help them uh, exceed and, su and succeed. So I think that's what how it happened really it was was when I became a manager of people that I realized what my joy was in that. In fact, I can tell you a quick story. I had an opportunity in my last corporate job, which was back in um, uh, 2017 was when I left that job in 2018. And um, I had an opportunity to take another position and it was a higher position. The, the company I was with or the organization had about 5,000 people. This would have put me in the top 25 of that 5,000 people. And I was very eager because obviously it had a great title. It had, a, had you know more money and it had a beautiful view of the Toronto Harbor from a, from a high rise uh, uh, office building. And then I found out that this position, even though it had all those things, didn't have any direct reports. There was nobody I'd be working with. It was what they used to refer to as, or they do refer to as a um, an in, individual contributor position. And when I heard that, I was not interested. I, I knew where my joy came from. I knew where my satisfaction came from, and it came from working with people and without people. That that view, that salary, that uh, that um, um, that title would have worn off. The novelty would have worn off really fast. So that was good to know. It's a great thing to know what you're good at, what you're not good at. So how do you hence the, the coaching and not acting? <laughs> so you're not acting. He hypnotized while you're himself, Kev. To, yes, in order... <laughs> how do you how how do you um, when you're working with a team, um, as we all have to do, uh, either in our daily lives or at the grocery store or what have you? How do you convince people to open up enough in order? for them to become a member of your team and a contributor? Well, I think it's important, what's important, I think, is that is that um, people need to um, know what their value is. And as a people leader, you have to know 
what unique contribution each person makes. And when you recognize people's value and they recognize their own value, they become super engaged. They become great members of a team. And when they tend to know what their value is, they start looking for the value in others. And this is a key point that I like to always talk about when I'm working with people or helping them develop is we, it, it's a misconception that we can be well-rounded as people. Um, what I mean by that is we can't be everything, even though we were told we should be, we should try and be everything. The reality is that instead of being well-rounded, I'm going to be a little bit corny here, but we're more like stars where the points of the star are what we are uniquely good at and what our unique contribution is. And when we take those those stars and put them together, then we create um, well-rounded partnerships, well-rounded work teams, well-rounded organizations, well-rounded relationships. But we, we have to let go, I think, of the notion that we can be everything. So once we realize what we're naturally inclined to be good at, then we can focus on that. And if my if your people manager or me as a people manager or when I was, if I can recognize that value, then they will too. Okay, so this is so that's really interesting because I was going to ask you about your talent DNA and mm -hmm. and and I a couple of things because I've I've done talent um, questionnaires and that's uh, yeah. uh, collaborate all of that stuff for I think maybe I've done twenty five of them throughout my career and it's mm -hmm. a little baffling to me and so I'm just trying to find that sweet spot so I want to yeah. kind of a want to ask you what's the real science behind determining your, I guess your purpose or or uh, the strengths um, that best determine what your purpose should be because, and then does it speak to then what you've done throughout your life? And then how did you then personally kind of connect the dots for you, for yourself to get that? Right. So I've done the same, done a ton of those assessments. Um, and the reality is I landed on one that I think is the best. Um, it's, um, it's called Clifton strengths it used to be called uh, strengths finder. People know it as strengths finder. I have that. Finder. I did that. Um, yeah. You did say, so Gallup, um, uh, Gallup uh, corporation man uh, ministers that, that assessment. It's been around, um, about almost, I think around 30 years. It's been taken by over 32 million people around the world in over 200 countries. And what I've discovered it does is it tells you, as I mentioned earlier, it tells you how your brain is wired. It tells you your um, what it, what it reveals. They say is your is your talents, and this is a, a term that refers to sort of positive personality attributes that you have. And it tells it gives you the results in a, in in an order of intensity for you. And what it tells us is what we're naturally gifted at. So uh, I'm going to get you guys to do something with me, and I'll get the, the the viewers and listeners to do the same thing if they're up for it. I'm going to ask you to just cross your arms. Just cross your arms. Okay. Now I'm going to ask you to do it the other way. Now, how does that feel? A little feel awkward. A little awkward, a little different. Now I'll go back the other way. It just happens naturally. It just, it just feels natural. It's very similar to this way. So we can do things that we're not naturally wired to be good at or... or um, in the in the terminology we use in the in in that strength world, we would say it's your um, how your brain is wired is your tendency to your your thought beliefs and patterns of of thought. So now we've got what we're naturally gifted at, and now we can focus on investing our time and effort into those things and developing those. And I will even say in this assessment, it actually doesn't tell you what your strengths are, even though it's called strengths um, clips and strengths. What it tells you is which you're naturally inclined to be good at, but it's just the raw material. You have to invest um, experience, desire, um, knowledge, skill. You put those together with this natural inclination of what you're good at, and then you can turn that into a strength, which you can really use, which is um, we would call the talent, the raw material, and the strength is the is it applied in a productive way. So, so, when I, so go ahead, Kevin. So what happens when the world around you Wants you to be something else, like yeah, your great other, question. like your boss. That is a great question. That is a great question. And so, what I would say is, is that um, 
we have what I would call we would call your dominant talents, which when, when you do this this uh, assessment that I'm talking about, this Clifton Strengths, it gives you um, 34 different talents um, or, or in, in, the, in the order that they are for you in intensity. The top 10 tend to be your dominant talents, the ones that really are what guides you every day. Your next group of 10 will be what we call your, your supporting talents. Those things would be the ones that you call upon when you need them. And the bottom third, well, we just say just let those go because you just don't have it. And so that's when you have to look for people to partner with. It doesn't mean you can't do things. Here, here's an example. Um, when I was in the corporate world, um, I, I was had to manage a multi-million dollar budget. Numbers is not my thing. And but I had to be competent enough to 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 run run this this um, department um, and manage the budget. But I was never going to be an accountant or an actuary. So this is this is what I'm talking about. So Kevin, what it means is that when we're called upon to be things we're not, we couldn't do them. It just means that we do it with greater difficulty, like folding your arms the other way. Or another example I do when I do workshops for groups, I ask them to <clears throat> write out a phrase. And just as they go to write it, I stop them and I say, but do it with your non-dominant hand. You can still write that phrase out. It takes more effort. It takes you longer, but you could still do it. Where if you do it with your dominant hand, it just becomes effortless. And that's what we're trying to get to is when I work with people and groups, what I try and get them to do is recognize what these naturally, what they're naturally gifted um, at and, and, and invest in that, as I said but to focus so, on those things. And Barry, so in your experience um, and through the many, many people that you've coached, uh, do you see uh, patterns evolving and what are they? What I've seen is the, the patterns I've seen is people tend to um, want to be everything. That's the one tendency I think I, I see. The other thing I see people doing is I see people when they get um, an assessment like this, and there's others that, that you can do. There's, Myers Briggs and there's and there's uh, insights colors and there's uh, all sorts of other ones that are out there, but um, what people tend to do is go to the ones that are at the bottom, and they say, "Well, if I could just fix those things, I'd be fine. If I could just fix my weaknesses, I would be fine." And one of the great quotes that came from Don Clifton, who who created this, um, he said that that um, um, weakness fixing prevents failure, but but strength building leads to success. I have to ask you about the hypnotism part of this yeah. only because it's okay. only because <laughs> it's, you know, listen, um, for the most of us and, and probably you at early stages in your life, uh, we were supposed to look at a, at a, at a pocket watch or something like that. Yeah. And, uh, and then you would be, and then you'd be revealing secrets about the uh, crime that took place around the corner that you can't remember, but it's somewhere buried deep in your psyche. How does hypnotism assist in in team building or even a building within your own character? Great question. So, so let me back up and tell you how I got into that in the first place. And so, what you don't know, Kevin, even though we've known each other for a long time, is I first got into hypnosis when I was a teenager, and back in the day, reading books and learning about it, and I tried it out um, um, on a girlfriend at the time, who you know, Kevin. <laughs> but back in the day of course <laughs> sorry um <clears throat> she'll remain nameless in case she watches this so many yeah. years later but um I, I i tried it out on her um at her home with her parents there and um i i had her um in an in trance do some things that 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 um um weren't bad, <laughs> weren't bad. <laughs> but the fact that she reacted and did the things scared me to death I was, it was, it felt so powerful and it felt so much like it was out of my, out of my hands, like the, that I just didn't feel qualified and I shouldn't be doing it. And I left it alone, but I always had it in the back of my mind. When I left my corporate job in 2018, um, it was a restructuring. My, my job disappeared and they offered me um, retraining if I wanted it. <clears throat> so I said to them, I want to train as hyp hypnosis. And, and they were like, what? Because my most of my career had been in corporate communications and, and public relations. And I went to them and I said, there's somebody I want to train with. And he's, he's, a, he's, a, he's a fellow who's known worldwide, happens to be based in Toronto. His name is Mike Mandel. I wanted to train with Mike because he's probably one of the best. Um, but I said, I want to train with the Mike Mandel Hypnosis Academy. And they're like, uh, no. <laughs> 
So I did some research and found out that at the University of Toronto, through continuing um, education, they offered a, a, a certificate program. And I did that for eight months part time and trained hypnosis. But this was hypnosis for individuals and groups. Um, and it was around things like um, stress management, weight loss, stop smoking, all that, those kind of uh, more traditional things. So instead of going out and becoming a, a putting a shingle out, although I did for a little while, of uh, being a hypnotist, what I realized was I wanted to be a coach and use that as a tool. And I jokingly say to people, um, I don't refer to myself um, as a, as if I was a, a carpenter using a hammer, I don't call myself a hammerist. And so because I used hypnosis as a tool in my coaching, I don't call myself a hypnotist so much, but I do use it. So the answer, Kevin, is, is that it can be used in different ways. Um, it can help people break through things, limiting beliefs about themselves, I don't use it in groups at the moment, but I use it for certainly with individuals. Um, but it does help them um, break through. It can if if there are things like like stress, anxiety that that are holding them back from doing what they really want to do. I can use that as a tool to help them break through. And then we use much more um, practical tools. So I do work with coaching individuals, executive coaching. But where I find my greatest joy is actually coaching groups. So what I do is I go out and do um, uh, online and in person workshops where I do um, corporate training using that. So I don't use hypnosis so much there, but certainly it's it's part of what I do. And there are different kinds of hypnosis, Kevin. So yes, indeed, the, 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 the swing and pocket watch was the way, and some people still can use things similar. I, there's people who use like a, um, a, a red light on the wall behind them. That you just, It's just a, something to focus on. So it just focuses your attention. So it allows you to bypass that critical faculty of your conscious mind and get to the unconscious mind and, and speak to it directly without filtering the, you know, things. And I mean, you know, Barry, you're in a tricky, when you're working with the, in the corporate world, it's tricky because, um, uh, when I worked in the, in the corporate world with wellness, it took a long time to change the culture years and years. If they, if in fact they wanted to truly change it and not have a bandaid, uh, re, uh, solution. So here's the thing. Although we, as humans, we want to, you know, we want to go to work and we want to do something that we enjoy and it's purposeful. I would say 90, at least 90% are not happy at what they do. I mean, statistically and, and we, and yet in the corporate world, the communication and the language is still such that job, inter, uh, job um, descriptions are ex extremely depressing the language that they use, and also the communication that, you know, when you start a job, the, they still use probationary period, you know, like prison terms. <laughs> and so this is what I've grappled with my entire career is these is this corporate language. And it does not match the hopefulness of embracing a, a happier um, uh, workplace. So help me <laughs> I, I agree this. with you um it's there's it's i see a shift though i see a shift happening so for example um again i'm not i'm not here to 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 um to uh um flog the the clifton strengths but i'll just use that as an example is that it's it's um it can be generational but it can also um happen quicker and yes the the the, the language is is a challenge but what I find is when we bring this kind of language in, where we talk about what's right with people, it sets a whole different tone in the workplace. And so, as I said, when when people start realizing what they're naturally good at, and they know what, what they bring to the table, what's their unique contribution, and when their manager values that contribution, then you're in a great place. So that's where things have to change. So, But I'm seeing it change. So when I talk about the Clifton Strengths, I can say that... that um, um, the last I heard, about 95% of Fortune 500 companies have used the Clifton Strengths Assessment, either as the Strengths Finder or Clifton Strengths, they changed the name in 2017. But they they've been using it, so it's it, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful. So, but but I'm talking about big companies like like um, Boeing and 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 Meta and um, Stryker that makes you know hospital equipment. These are companies that 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 are what they refer to as strength based organizations. Not only that, but but we see it in academia too. There's over 600 universities and colleges that use this as a tool as well. Um, um, one of my colleagues works, um, I believe it's Duke University, and she was saying that their incoming freshmen were um, changing their 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 major after the first year, but it was like a huge number, like like 
a huge percentage. They were changing. And after they did the assessment coming in, they realized what they were naturally good at and they could focus their attention on that. And that number dropped considerably. So it's, it's, um, it's great to see it happening. But it's that change that I see happening in the corporate world that keeps me inspired to work, keeps me inspired to do this work. Like, I don't want to stop. Like, for example, I heard um, um, Paul McCartney was interviewed and they said to him, like he's now 81 now, I guess. And they said, um, when are you going to retire? And he thought about it and he said he called Willie Nelson, who was probably 90. And he said, yeah. um, Willie, when are you, you going to retire? And Willie said, retire from what? Exactly. And it's not, it's not the life we want. We want to keep going and, and contributing um, because we love it. Okay. And, and I, and I, I do love it. So um, I'm going to tell you a quick story that happened about how change can happen and change can happen in, in when you make a decision. And you may be aware of at, at these live events that Tony has, they have, um, they do these firewalks. They, they put the hot coals on people walk on the hot coals. So one day I was, um, I was tasked to be on the firewalk or one of the firewalks. And I was being trained by a person there about how to do it. And the person said, <clears throat> you, you walk beside a person who's walking through long hot coals. And as they're walking along, they, they said, if the person, because they're looking up, walking, you know, good pace. They said, right. if they start veering off, don't push them back on. <laughs> because the goal isn't to get from the start of the, of the hot coals to the end of the hot coals. It's the first step you make. Make that first step, make that first step of trust or that first step to make a change. That's all that matters. It doesn't matter if you veer off. You can still make that, 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 um, the big change happens in that moment when you make that decision. So that's like, that's like, uh, we talked to someone last week about, uh, staying in cold water and jumping into cold water for the first time. It's the same a foot in cold water. Now there's a, uh, there's a there's little a, musical attribute, a band. but, um, but, uh, um, uh, all of this seems to be in search of fulfillment in some way. Um, yep. what you're talking about, uh, in search of happiness, perhaps the pursuit of happiness, um, which has all other sorts of things attached to it. But uh, so, you know, we're kind of running out of time. So I want to ask you, what, what is happiness? Mm. I think, I think happiness for me is a sense of um, having purpose and um, I feel like if I have purpose and I'm being um, authentic, that's where happiness comes from for me. Did you always have that? No, no. I think it's been a journey. It's been a journey. And and I've had moments of it. I've had glimpses of it. But I still think it's a lifelong journey. And, you know, and I'm inspired to see people who um appear to be happy because they have a purpose and they and their their life has a meaning. For example, I <clears throat> I got up this morning and saw that um it's Don Cherry's 90th birthday today. <laughs> and Don Cherry is still doing his podcast and he's still commenting and he's still working and he's still, you know, um he's not sitting in his rocking chair mm. waiting for the end to come. Or Willie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. <clears throat> so I think that's the answer. Is it? Is it? Is it really? It's about the, the happiness comes from having a sense of purpose and meaning, and um, and be able to be an authentic, your authentic self. No, um, we have known each other a long time. Um, let me say, you know, you used to, you seemed to, have, you you were a kid that stuttered as a kid. You were yeah. a kid that uh, you were a kid that was often unsure of himself, as we all are as kids. Yeah. Uh, I mean, has any of this helped your confidence? hundred percent. So it's a whole other conversation, but you're right. I was a stutterer as a kid. I was in speech therapy and, but was able to overcome that to become a voice actor. <laughs> Although I will say, I will say that I did appear in a film once where, um, I said some words, <laughs> my my lines, and they they yelled, "Cut! We're going to move on." And the sound guy said, "Hang on for a second. He walked over to me and he said, 
did you say this? And it was a stutter. And I said, yeah, I did. And he goes, that wasn't good for me. Let's just do another one. And I got a chance to do it over. So that's what I love about movies rather than being on stage is I can do it over. <clears throat> <laughs> but you're quite right. It, it, you know, it's, um, it's about not letting things that um, are appear to be barriers to stand in your way. It's not giving up in the sense of um, saying, this is just what it is. So I'm just going to live with it. And so I think, yeah, that, I think that, that that's, that's the answer is, is it's, um, it's, it's an, it's an ongoing journey and I am happier now than I've ever been in my life. Okay. Barry, okay. could you please tell me who's your biggest influence in your life? Maybe surprisingly, the biggest influence in my life has been Kevin Tibbles. And that's a fact. And it started when we were teenagers, when we were 15 years old, sitting in our grade nine homeroom. And he doesn't know any of these things, by the way. He doesn't know this. I don't. What he doesn't know is that is that I tried to model him in many ways. Wow. He got he got the girls. He got the he was he was super popular in school. He, he was yes. he was fearless in many ways. I could tell you stories about how he raised money for for a United Way by by um, being a singing jukebox. And, and uh, <laughs> he was a singing jukebox, um, singing my dingaling. I remember this like it was yesterday. But I only I actually was actually when I started writing, he had a way of writing that was like a um, a hybrid between writing and printing. And I copied his his style of writing. He didn't know any of these things. I copied my style of writing for him. And I've been watching his 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 journey of his career since the day that he borrowed my suit jacket to go to his job interview when he came back from Europe and didn't have anything to wear for his job interview at CBC. Do you wow, remember that? That's a great story. But but he's he's been the, he was he was the guy, and and so he set me on a certain path. But I'll say one more thing. It's maybe more than you want to hear, but but the the thing is, I, I did learn as well is that, or I have learned, is that this idea of modeling somebody or trying to be somebody else is not the way to go. The way to go is to be who you are and be the I best version of you. And I was, you know, I think that some, um, I think it was Oscar Wilde said, um, "Be yourself. Everyone else is taken." Yeah, I love that. I hey, Bear, thanks. That that was very kind, and um, and I'm. Uh, Glad uh, that you continued being you. That's wonderful. And and Barry, we talked about happiness. We talked about you're feeling happier than you ever have in your life. And is why do you believe in people? So, I believe in people because they. Um, I believe in the inherent goodness of people. I think I mentioned it to you guys before. I believe that people are good, and I think there's yes, there's lots of evil in the world, and there's lots of people that do bad things. I think that we 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 um, generally come out of the womb as good people, and so I believe in people because I look for the goodness in people. I look for um, I look for it, and and I'm a, I'm like a miner. <laughs> I mine for goodness, and when you find that goodness and you find it everywhere, every day, like even you know. Podcasts like your guys, where you're bringing people in every week that that, that 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 do believe in people, and they and they they uplift, and they make us feel good about ourselves. And I think that's that's why I believe in people is that is that I believe that that people have um, an unlimited capacity to be good and good to each other. And I think that's what we want to get to is where we um, are all feeling like we can be living our genuine lives, and when we do, um, things are going to be great. Well. Uh, Barry Kionbot, thank you so much uh, for spending a half hour with us. I'm going to be out looking for the five points on my stars. I might even uh, see if I can write them down after this conversation. Thank you very much for spending time with us. Thanks, my Barry. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me, Amy. Thanks, Kevin. Pleasure. Thanks so much. You know, the takeaway from what Barry has shared with us today is, first of all, life's a journey and that we we need to embrace you know, the, our strengths and that we do, what he did say was that we sort of tend to look down the list at maybe number 35 to say something that maybe we're not that strong at, but we want to get better at. And I think sort of for me, it's like, okay, let's just let that go. And then do sort of the top five things that we're kind of good at. It's actually reassuring. So I feel good about that conversation. Thank you, Barry. Yeah. Thanks, Barry. And uh, be proud of what you're good at. Use it. 
build on your successes. Why not? If you want to hear another uh, inspiring conversation, then uh, subscribe to this podcast, Believe in People, or listen again next week. Thank you very much.